Welcome to the Be Well Network program. My name is Dr. Ted Bender. I'm a clinical psychologist and the CEO of the Be Well Network. If you or a loved one is struggling, please visit BeWellRecovery.com. Our number is 888-317-8395. My goal in this program is to educate people and to help many understand that they are not alone. There is help for the many life obstacles we endure. Today, I'm pleased to have Dr. Edward Selby on the show to discuss various treatments for addiction and the research behind substance use disorders. Dr. Selby, thank you again for being on the show. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about yourself, what you do, and what your expertise is in the field? Certainly. Well, it's a real pleasure to be here. So I am a licensed psychologist as well as an associate professor at Rutgers University in New Jersey, where I'm the director of the Emotion and Psychopathology Lab, where we look at various problematic behaviors, including substance use, binge eating, self-injury, and suicidal behavior to try and help patients overcome those problems. I'm also the lead research analyst for the Be Well Network, where my job is to oversee all research activities, data integration, and really just to make sure that Be Well is providing the most efficacious treatments available for patients to make sure they're leaving treatment with the best chance of overcoming addiction as possible. I'm glad you talk about that because, I, as you know, I'm a big proponent for research in treatment of substance use disorders and other mental health disorders, and it needs to be an ongoing process. Why do you view research as so important to this process, and why do you think it's in, critically important for especially substance use disorder treatment to not only continue to research ways to treat the illness, but to gather data while the patients are in treatment and out of treatment as well? Uh, that's a great question. Psychology is one of those topics where people often think that it's just plain common sense. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, if that, were, if that were true, the world would be a better place. Yes. But the problem is, is that common sense it depends on your sub subjective frame, right? Mm -hmm. So one person's common sense might seem like another person's foolishness. Mm -hmm. And the same applies to psychology and treating mental illness. And with psychological treatments, we often have to test them to determine if they actually work versus have no effect. And sometimes they can even be harmful. Huh. And so a treatment that might seem like it's a shoe in in terms of helping someone might actually have no effect at all, or it could even actually end up harming them. So if I'm hearing you correctly, it's not only important to do the research to make sure that the treatment you're providing is effective or efficacious, it's equally as important to ensure that you're not actually causing harm to patients. Yeah, absolutely. Another uh, point I just would make as well is that without research, we don't really understand the nature of some of these conditions. And common sense can actually lead you astray. Mm -hmm. So with addictions, if we went back a couple hundred years ago, people would think that the main cause of addiction is a poor moral character yeah. or that you're just a bad person. Whereas today, we've done so much research that we know that sp uh, certain people have specific vulnerabilities toward addiction that other people don't have. That's why someone can have a couple of beers and be fine, and another person, that might actually send them on a, a drinking binge. Yeah. And so, you know, decades ago, people didn't even think biology played any role in addiction whatsoever. And now we know that it's a huge part of addiction, and now it's also something that we focus on treating mm -hmm. with addiction. You know, you mentioned the, the biological components of it, and when I was uh, in college, before I got into this field, I didn't really understand addiction at that point either. And I met, uh, I met someone who ended up being a lifelong friend of mine, and he told me about his struggles with addiction and how he was in recovery for many years at that point. Uh, he was a sponsor for other people in the AA community, and he was doing really well. And I remember asking him, as I was just a college student at the time, a junior in college, and I said to him, I said, you know, what if you're at a picnic or a, a fun, sun-filled Saturday, and there's a whole cooler full of ice-cold beers in there? How can you not just go over and have just one? And his answer to this question ended up impacting my career for decades after that. And really kind of, I think, what ended up maybe even turning me towards mental health and wanting to help treat it. His answer was profound and never left me. He said, you know what? Because I wouldn't stop at that one beer. I would drink that one beer, and then I would drink the rest of the beer in the cooler, and then I would probably throw up from drinking so much, and then as soon as all that was gone and I had thrown up, I'd go straight to the liquor store to buy a bottle. So when you, when you mentioned that, you know, that component of biology, whereas one person may be able to have a few and stop, whereas someone else, I think that's an extreme example, but really kind of gets at exactly what you're talking about. 
Yeah, exactly. And, you know, there's a lot of differences between patients. And you might have some patients who have that sort of extreme uh, response, which is often very biologically driven. But then you might have other patients who have a little bit more ability to to monitor their intake who actually might benefit from more counseling about when to use alcohol Mm -hmm. or, uh, you know, potentially things like marijuana and what's an appropriate way to do so and what's a healthy way to do so as opposed to saying you can't use any kind of alcohol ever, for example. There are various definitions of what recovery is Mm -hmm. these days. And to our audience, uh, I have a strong background in clinical psychology, as does Dr. Selby, and we are both very strong proponents for, for data and research. Uh, and as the CEO of the Be Well Network, um, I d- that has not been lost on me. One of the first things I did when I became CEO of Be Well Network was I reached out to Dr. Selby to become our lead research analyst, which he graciously accepted uh, uh, and has joined us in this mission to help reduce overdose deaths and treat mental health disorders here in Southern California. Tell me a little bit about your role as lead research analyst at Be Well, what you're working on and what you're trying to accomplish. I'd be happy to. So in, in the, my role as lead research analyst for Be Well, my goal is to one, make sure that we're scrutinizing every treatment that's offered yes. by Be Well to make sure that it's something that would be considered scientifically efficacious. Uh-huh as well as to make sure that it's going to provide the uh, best, most efficient course of treatment for the patient. So that involves scrutinizing our current uh, curriculum in terms of the groups that are offered, the different individual therapy modalities that are provided, as well as potentially exploring new treatment components to add on to the current curriculum. For example, more recently we were exploring uh, magnetic resonance therapy for uh, addictions, and we thought there might be some room to incorporate this, but it's still something that we're pioneering. Mm -hmm. And so that's just one way that I try to integrate research into the treatment process at Be Well. But other things I do involve uh, monitoring data for both treatment outcomes as well as the risk factors that patients come into treatment with. And we have a couple ways of managing data, uh, one of which I'll get to in a little bit. But one of the things that we do is we have our own data set where we collect patients in terms of the their entry into the program, the kind of risk factors that they come up with, mm-hmm. come in with, substance abuse diagnoses, mental health diagnoses, and then we track them throughout the course of their treatment. And we're able to use that data to look back at our treatment outcomes and say, huh, people with a specific diagnosis are dropping out sooner. Maybe there's something that we can implement exactly. that would actually help them stay in treatment to increase their completion rates or potentially uh, move them to a different level that might be more helpful. Uh, one of the things that I found that's the most impactful is actually whether, uh, in terms of the clinical outcomes we're looking at, if we can have the patients meet with a family member mm-hmm. early on in the treatment process, that actually will double the length that mm-hmm. they can stay in treatment. Now, that's not necessarily a research finding per se, but rather it's a clinical outcome yes. that we can monitor, and it shows us as we work with patients that if we can really encourage the patient to meet with their family members as a part of the treatment process, that that has a good indication of potentially helping their recovery. <clears throat> a good uh a good example of utilizing the data that you have at hand to adjust the treatment course based on how they're scoring or how they're reporting during treatment, yep. rather than just the subject, subjective nature of the therapist or staff member based on how they feel things are going. Absolutely. And for our listeners, another thing that, that Dr. Selby mentioned that I want to highlight is that there are frontline treatments for different mental health disorders. And I wish I could say in mental health we had excellent treatments for every mental health condition out there. But the the reality of it is we do have some very good treatments for some disorders. We have some okay treatments for other disorders. And then there are other mental health disorders that don't respond so well to traditional treatments. So we are always making sure that the treatments that we're delivering to patients are the most up-to-date, backed by science and research that we have available to us in our toolkit. Um, but one other thing that Dr. Selby mentioned too is it's also important to be monitoring the research, or be monitoring the science, for any new types of treatment that may be on the horizon or may be even more efficacious or effective than what we're currently offering. And that is a critical thing to be doing 
as a treatment facility, as a medical community, as a mental health uh, establishment, and really all across the United States is always being open to and being up to date and knowledgeable <clears throat> about new treatments that are coming along that could be more effective or work faster and ultimately save lives. With all that in mind, how are you ensuring that data integration is happening at Be Well and that we're using, con we're constantly using the massive amount of data that we have to not only integrate that into the treatment protocols but improve outcomes? Uh, in addition to what I pr previously mentioned, uh, I want to talk about Track 9, which is a really comprehensive data integration system that we've set up. And that's uh, a system that follows the patient from the time that they come in and start treatment with mm -hmm. BeWell to uh, repeated monitoring during their treatment and stains in the program to even when they graduate the program and leave. And what it does is it provides a comprehensive assessment of a variety of risk factors, mm. uh, psychological risk factors, spirituality, mental health characteristics. And then what it can do is that they have a uh, proprietary data algorithm mm -hmm. that they can actually use on their end to predict if someone's at risk for high dropout. Interesting. But in addition to that, we also uh, look at the data in our own ways in addition to that algorithm to try and determine what factors are working best. And then we'll even look at some simple things like patient satisfaction. Mm -hmm. Were they satisfied with their treatment? Yeah. What did they find the most helpful in terms of their recovery? And not only do we tend to find that the patients seem to be very pleased with their recovery, but they're also reporting that's very effective and that they're feeling confident that they can leave uh, the rehabilitation mm -hmm. center and maintain the treatment effects that they have received. Yeah, that's very interesting. And I think it's an absolutely critical part of any substance use disorder treatment um, company or facility out there. You know, one of the things that, that Dr. Selby was mentioning with that is we're able to see not only just by what patients are telling us or what we're observing, but we're able to use this data, data to pivot during the course of treatment if necessary. Here's a good example. Imagine you are a patient going through treatment and we have a specific treatment plan created for you and you're going along with the process, but we get some of your scores back that say that your commitment to treatment or commitment to therapy is incredibly low or it's dropped by 60%. That gives us the ability then at that point, it gives the therapist and the treatment team the ability to take a step back, to refocus the treatment plan, and really work on enhancing commitment to therapy. And there are many ways that we can do that. If we did not have that data access or that data available to us, we might miss that completely, continue on with the treatment plan that we had laid out, not seeing or, rec or realizing that the patient's commitment to even being in treatment has gone through the floor. So you can see just from that one example about having this data available to us really creates better treatment outcomes, better adherence to treatment, and hopefully lo to longer lasting sobriety uh, and, and less symptoms of mental illness. And that's really one of the major reasons we brought Dr. Selby on board. So what's in store for the future? What kind of research projects are you going to be working on from here? You know, what are your, your hopes and dreams and visions for the research arm of Be Well? Uh, that's a great question. You know, dr dreams are big. Yeah. And, you know, at Be Well, we want to, you know, first we want to make sure that what we're doing is the most effective possible. Yes. And I think that we can say that already we've seen some really promising effects. Yes. But I think I would say that everyone at Be Well wants to maximize those mm -hmm. effects. Mm -hmm. So a lot of right now we're uh, examining different outcomes to try and make sure that everything is tailored to maximize the best outcome for all patients. Yeah. Um, in addition to that process, though, we want to continue to expand the re research infrastructure to bring in a formal research process where we're actually going to have patients, if they vol are voluntarily consenting to do so, mm -hmm to engage in the research process so that we can help determine what are the best ways that research can help us develop these kind of programs across the country mm -hmm. in addition to what's offered at BeWell so that we could collect patient data and uh, potentially publish a research report mm -hmm. on that so that other programs can say, hey, here's research that's showing these programs are effective which is a different level than our own data, which we can make uh, decisions however we'd like. But if you can actually publish published research, then other programs know that there's a level of scientific 
uh, empirical scrutiny that supports those findings. You know, I was recently on Business Worldwide with Kathy Ireland discussing the overdose epidemic in this country. And for our listeners and for those of you watching on the YouTube channel, we lost over 100,000 lives in the United States to overdose death in a 12-month period, the most ever on record. And what Dr. Selby is talking about is something that's incredibly critical to the advancement of the science of addiction treatment. At Be Well, we are not only committed to maximizing the outcomes uh, and the efficacy and effectiveness of our treatment with our patients for the short and long term, but we're also heavily committed to expanding and understanding and moving the science of addiction treatment forward. And that's what Dr. Selby was brought on to do as well. And with his extensive experience in psychological research and his prominence in the publication arena uh, and uh, his tenured position at Rutgers University, we know that we have the right person on board to help us accomplish those dreams. So, Dr. Selby, you know, one of the things I've spoke about for, for many years to my own colleagues or conferences or people is to help, you know, treatment facilities and hospitals realize that one of their most valuable resources is actually the data that they have. A lot of people or a lot of companies don't even realize how much they have and how valuable that really is. You and I remember as grad students trying to get access to patient populations, right, to do our research. And remember how difficult it was to get into like a mental health facility or a hospital, get to get that collaboration going so we could utilize that data. I mean, we had our the doors slammed in our face over and over again, right? So I've always thought, and I remember being in grad school thinking, wow, you know, what if we had access to a large mental health organization to partner with, to, to work with patients that are in treatment now who are in the middle of a severe mental health disorder or substance use disorder and utilize the power of that data to advance the science. I mean, it's literally not only saving lives of people that are in treatment currently, but it's saving lives of future generations. And that's why we do the science and the work. Yeah, well, I, you know, just sort of jumping off that uh, statement, one of the benefits to the approach that we're taking is the speed with which we could potentially accomplish exactly. research. You know, if you, if you, let's say you had a new treatment component that you wanted to try and do research mm -hmm. on, uh, perhaps a new uh, group therapy session mm -hmm. or a new technological intervention, uh, normally you'd have to apply for grants, mm -hmm. go through the process of trying to get the grant, which can take a long time. And then even when you get it, then you're given resources, but not necessarily the resources you need. It might yeah. be a limited version of what you might need. And then you try and collect the data and publish that. The result of that is, is we get a lot of innovative studies with very few patients involved in the study. Right. And that just makes an un unideal situation for research. Well, if you already have a treatment program going that's trying to help patients get better, and you have a research infrastructure included in there, right. you can get much larger patient samples for the research and show much more uh, efficaciously that the treatment program is working. So there's a huge benefit to doing research in this kind of setting as opposed to what you might call more traditional uh, academic research setting. In addition to the work that you're doing with the research and the data, one of the things that I think has been you've been really contributing to is our blog. Uh, and for our, for our listeners out there, uh, Dr. Selby has been writing a lot of content articles for us, which a lot of treatment facilities do. Uh, the difference between what Dr. Selby is doing and a lot of the other articles I see out there is he is taking a lot of time to thoroughly research all of the uh, information that he's putting out there, uh, which he then carefully vets, and it's very unique and new different kinds of content. Um, so talk a little bit about the blog, some of the topics you've been writing about, and what, you th what you're thinking about for the future with the blog. Uh, absolutely. Well, it's, it's really my pleasure to write the blog because it's really a way that I can talk to people out there who I, you know, I might not know uh, and try to help communicate and disseminate these really important ideas and research findings that get people motivated for treatment. Mm -hmm. And I always try to think of if, if I had the a potential patient or a family member of a patient and I had them and a chance to sit down and speak with them, what would I want them to know? And what might they be thinking that would be in their decision process as to whether to seek treatment? And so that's the uh, approach I take with the blog to the, try to bring it to a level that a patient can really uh, empathize with. Yeah. 
and then also to bring in and, and try to include the scientific component in a way that gets across and isn't trying to force them into a lecture, but rather trying to provide them in, enough information to make an educated decision. Yeah, and at, at Be Well, we're, we're getting very close to launching a female-only uh, addiction treatment center focusing not only on the addiction, but the different types of trauma that women are often exposed to. And you recently wrote a little bit about that. Absolutely. That was, uh, for me, actually an article that I learned a lot about uh, because I've worked in different kinds of programs, but never specifically a women's only treatment, yeah. substance use treatment program. And for me, just reading through the literature and seeing how different programs work was really informative to learn uh, things like, for example, a patient, a female patient might be pregnant mm -hmm. and think, oh, I can't go get treatment right. because that might get me in trouble. And actually, that's something that most uh, women's only treatment programs are actually really keenly focused on yes. to try and make sure that they have a safe place where they can get treatment, that they can get recovered from their addiction and make sure that they're being the best mom that they can be when the baby is born. And another aspect that was really important was really understanding that a lot of women have been exposed to traumatic experiences. Uh -huh. And those women tend to respond much more positively to women's only treatment programs than to mixed programs, which are also very effective and helpful. But uh, if someone had a trauma experience and was considering a women's program, that would be a perfect fit. Hmm. Another reason why we do the research, yep. right? Because otherwise, how would we know if a women's only center did better than a mixed center in that exact kind of scenario? Yes. Know? Right. And to our listeners, again, remember that Dr. Selby writes all of our educational blogs on our website about all of these topics and more to help you. Please visit BeWellRecovery.com and select the Resources tab and then select Blogs. Thank you, Dr. Selby, so much for being a guest on the show today. Remember to our listeners, please like and subscribe to our channel to stay informed. You are not alone. Until next time, I'm Dr. Bender. Be well.